Hey, let's uh, stand. I know you're visiting, but greet someone. Be sure and greet our guests here today. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're honored that all of you are here today. Uh, thank you for being in church this morning. Amen. Today is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. What a privilege today to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's the first day of the week. It's the beginning of whatever's going to happen this week. But we're going to give this first day to the Lord today and be in His presence. I'm believing God's going to do great things. Amen. I want us just to open. Sister Cheyenne's going to come in a moment, but I just want us to open in prayer and ask the Lord to have His way today. Would you do that with me right now? Lord Jesus, I thank You for Your presence that is here today. Lord, it's not another. You are in this room right now. I thank You for that promise. I thank You for Your, your presence that is promised to meet with us. But we know you are here. We felt you already. We've experienced the power of your word already. We've experienced the convicting of your spirit already. We've received from your word already. And Lord, we just ask you in the worship service today that you would have your way. Lord, bring us into one mind and one accord. Let us to experience your presence in a mighty way. Life changing. Let us receive with meekness. Let us receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. I'll let you be seated. We're going to take a moment. Today is Mission Sunday, the first uh, Sunday of the month. We always take just a little time to focus on some of the missionaries that we support with your continued offerings once a month. So thank you so much for giving. Let's welcome Sister Cheyenne, our missions uh, director, as she comes to share with you what God is doing. Praise the Lord, church. It is a good day to be in his house. I'm so glad to be here today. The focus this month, um, I would like to focus on the Middle East. And within this part of the world, there are several um, access challenge nations. There's several nations that don't have missionaries. There's several nations that don't even know the name of Jesus. And I just want to focus on those nations today. The name of Jesus can't be spoken in those nations. The Bible is seen as false teaching in those nations. This part of the world suffers from conflict, war, and division. But this does not stop the King of Kings. He endures to the end and he knows what is going on throughout the world. He knows the beginning to the ending. Nothing surprises him. The missionary family has been blessed with a Move the Mission vehicle. So our youth is familiar with Move the Mission. Our church is familiar with this. And this family has been blessed to have a vehicle to spread his gospel. God has been using this family in weekly home Bible studies, teaching kids classes. Um, those are just to name a few. And after six months of weekly intensive language studying, these missionaries have a solid foundation of the new language. And this is such a huge barrier for missionaries. I mean, if you imagine Brother Gene coming up and speaking Spanish to us every Sunday, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be very fun. So this is such a huge barrier and these missionaries have just hit the ground running learning a new language. The groups are growing and are having to find new locations to meet and that's so awesome. To God be the glory. There was 40 days of prayer and fasting that coincided with the Ramadan season and I'm believing with them that these prayers are making a difference in the spiritual realm. They had a general conference and there was powerful preaching that went forth in every service and there were over 30 that were filled with the Holy Ghost. To God be the glory. We just thank him for what he's doing. And as I was looking over my notes last night, I was just reading through some verses and this one in Psalms chapter 20 just popped out to me. It said, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And then I just started thinking about his name and what his name means. So I started, I went to Isaiah chapter 9. And we hear this verse during Christmas, 
but it just, it popped out to me. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government, the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And sometimes we have a lot of things going on in our life and we're just like, God, I just, I want someone to talk to. I just want someone to listen to me. But his name is the Wonderful Counselor. If you just sit in his presence, you can just speak to him about what's on your mind, what you're going through. He is a Wonderful Counselor. He is the Mighty God and he's the Prince of Peace. Lord, we need peace in our world today and he is the Prince of it. If we want to stand today, we're going to pray for these missionaries, pray for this part of the world. We want to pray for God-ordained connections with people. We want to pray for these missionaries' minds as they're still learning the language, as they're still learning customs. We want to pray for peace during this time of war in that area of the world. We want to pray for unity and growth. And we want to pray for laborers to be sent. We want to pray that God would just put a desire in hearts to just go and seek his, his kingdom that want to go and reach people throughout the world. So if you would just pray with me, just lift these missionaries up. Lord, I thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing throughout the world. Lord, I thank you, God, for laborers that have said yes, that have gone, that have trusted you, Lord. I thank you, God, for your word that is going forth. Lord, I pray, God, for your peace, God. Your word says you are the Prince of Peace, God, and I pray, God, that your peace, God, would be forever settled, God, in these nations as it is in heaven, Lord. Lord, I pray your word would continue to go forth, God. Lord, I pray for those missionaries' minds, God. Whatever comes against them, Lord, we know you can conquer all things. Lord, we know all things are done in your name, God. You can do anything, Lord. Lord, I thank you, God, for what you're doing. God, I pray for unity. God, I pray for growth, God. Lord, I pray your word to go forth, God, in this place today, God, and throughout the world. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Cheyenne. And uh, these missionaries we can't even name. We can't even call the names of the, of the countries that they are ministering in. But we know that God knows where they are. Amen. We believe there's a harvest field even in the darkness of these challenged nations. We believe that God is going to raise up a church. Amen. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it because it's built upon a rock. And I know who that rock is. It's not the disciples. It's Jesus. It's not the post-apostolic fathers. It's Jesus. That rock is not a denomination or another church. It's Jesus. Everything's built on Jesus. Everything's built on Jesus. He's the cornerstone. Let's give the Lord praise today for what he has done, what he is doing, and for who he is today. Lord, we're thankful. We give you glory and praise today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Our choir is coming to sing today. Let me make just a few announcements. Let's give our guests a warm welcome here today. Amen. Amen. As the choir gathers to sing, remember coming up. Amen. Some somebody's real enthusiastic about our guest today. <laughs> That's good. We ought to be enthusiastic about our guest. Somebody say amen. Today is the last day to order t-shirts. This is for the block party that is coming up August 31st. It's a great time of giving back to our community. I encourage you to, uh, uh, if you want to volunteer to help that day, uh, even if it's just for a segment of time, this is an opportunity for us to, to uh, get to know those that will be gathered here to take part in what we're going to provide for them. So it's going to be a great day. Uh, also, uh, today, there will be a special time of... Uh, uh, we spend together uh, developing, uh, sharpening one another today at 5 p.m. We call it leadership development. There will be a QR code on the screen. If you'll get your phone, open the, the camera app, and you get ready to uh, register for that. It will send you a link, and you can join us today at 5 p.m. virtually. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week is prayer and fasting revival. The focus will be our schools. Our young people or students are going back to school here. I can't believe uh, we're already at the end of summer, and, and kids are going back to school, but here we are. Uh, but uh, we'll be praying together 
uh, Monday. Uh, we'll be praying at 6.30 uh, to 7.30. We'll be church prayer in the sanctuary. There'll be children's prayer, prayer and youth prayer also at that time. But then Tuesday, there'll be a prayer journey. We'll meet in the front of the church in the old ch- parking lot, in the south parking lot in front of the old sanctuary. And we're going to go and pray over our schools, our school facilities, that God would keep the teachers, keep the students, put his blood upon them to cover them. I believe the Lord can protect our teachers and our students. Somebody say amen. Amen. Also, Friday at 6 p.m. here in the kids' church room, which is just to your left, my right, uh, there is a Bible study training. Uh, this is for anyone currently teaching a home Bible study, or if you're interested in teaching a home Bible study, we want to uh, sharpen that sickle as well. And next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday, is a free will uh, offering for our block party if you want to give toward that. Uh, and the food and the bounce houses and the prizes we're going to give to our community. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Lord, we thank you today for your blessings. For this day, we have to worship you. Lord, I ask you to pour your spirit out in a mighty way in this place today. Speak to us through your word and through your spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Worship with the choir as they sing today unto the Lord. It was sinking sand. I put my ruins into your hands and watch you restore them like only you can. In the Lord build the house, no one can tear it down. In the Lord build the house, no
rejoicing in the house. Come on, I feel confidence in the house today. Come on, somebody knows the Lord is doing something. Come on, in a world that's shaking and reeling and rocking, we're on a sure foundation. We're in the church. We're a part of the bride of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, let's worship him together. Thank you, Lord, that you're building a house. Thank you, Lord, that you're making a way. Thank you, Lord, that you're our hope. Thank you, Lord, that our hope is sure today. We give you praise today, Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. Well, we're living in a world of uncertainty, but I'm telling you right now, there is no uncertainty with the kingdom of God, with his church. Somebody say amen. He's taking us somewhere. He said, I'm going to prepare a place, and if I go to prepare it, don't, don't ever think I won't come get you to take you to the place I prepared for you. That tells me that he's going to bring us through. <laughs> That tells me he's got an appointment with his people. Turn your neighbor and tell him everything's going to be all right. Don't let the devil make you anxious. Don't let your fear make you worry. We're on solid ground today. We're on unshakable footing today. And that rock is Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's stand all over this building. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Focus your attention on Jesus today. Get your eyes on the kingdom today. Hallelujah. Lift your eyes under the hills. Oh, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen. It's in this kind of atmosphere I believe the Lord can heal. Amen. I believe the Lord is a healer. We want to go to the Lord in prayer today. There have been many saints of God that's texted me this morning, and they're battling last night, battling congestion and uh, flu-like symptoms and people just getting over it, people just getting it. And, uh, uh, I guess that makes us all family. <laughs> uh, but Sister Anna Bumgarner needs our prayers today. Alexa is still recovering from uh, surgery today. And... Uh, we want to remember Jane, uh, Sister Jana Martin. She's been battling this congestion. She's actually in the hospital. Uh, pray for Sister Jana. And then Cecilia Burton is having tests this week, needs a touch from the Lord. Let's pray over Sister Cecilia today. And LaVon Pitts needs healing in recovery. And let's pray, uh, or needs healing today. Let's pray for her. Amen. I believe the Lord is able. And there'll be uh, names on the screen behind me. It doesn't mean they're not as important because we don't physically call them. These are just ones that maybe slipped in after we already had that prepared so there will be needs that are presented on the screen behind me let's pray for them also and as we begin to pray if you're here this morning you need prayer for your body or you need prayer for a situation you're dealing with we invite you to come the book of James tells us that we ought to pray call for the elders pray for those that are sick and I believe uh, God will answer those prayers Somebody say amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day we have to bring our petitions. Lord, those that are sick this morning, those that have a need in their life. Lord, we just pray this morning that your hand would be demonstrated. Lord, that you would have your way this morning, Lord. And that's those that are in this room today that need healing, that need deliverance, that need care, that need encouragement, maybe in their physical body or in their heart and their mind. I pray today that you would do your work. Lord, touch Levine Pitts today. Give her the healing that she needs. Touch Cecilia today, Lord. Whatever test, oh Lord, we just pray, to God, that there'd be a, a, a testimony of, of health in her body in the name of Jesus. We pray that your hand would be upon her, Lord. Give her what she needs today. You're able to provide healing. You've already made a way for it. Now, as we believe it, Lord, we're standing on your word today. Touch Sister Jana Martin, who's in the hospital. Lord, go to her right now and give her the strength in her body. Touch her lungs. This congestion we rebuke in the name of Jesus. Touch Sister Anna Bumgarner, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I'm standing on your word this morning, Jesus. Touch Alexa Timsor this morning, Jesus. I pray right now your hand would be upon her. Give her complete recovery in the name of Jesus. Give her complete recovery. Touch Brother Carl and Sister Ruby Veal today. 
God, I pray your hand would be upon them this morning. Strengthen them. Touch them, Lord. Oh, Lord, by your stripes we are healed. Touch Brother Paul this morning, God. Lord, I know you're able to touch him and strengthen him today. In the name of Jesus. Lord, those that have come today for prayer, Lord, I believe you're a prayer answering God. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, church. We're going to take a few moments just to believe that God is going to answer right now. Hallelujah. Lord, we're going to, we're going to seek you. Hallelujah. We're going to knock. We're going to ask. We're going to seek. Lord, I believe in you to answer, Jesus. Lord, I believe in you to make a way, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for it, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And we give you the praise, O oh Lord. We give you the glory, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you connect with someone beside you? Let's pray together right now. Just pray all across this building. Pray one for another, Lord, as we bind together families, parents and children, husbands and wives, friends, as we gather across this congregation, I'm praying, Lord, your touch would come to each one that is here today. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for it. Oh, Lord, speak, Lord, to us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. This is an integral part of worship, our giving, amen. When Jesus went to the synagogue, he chose his seat in the area where they would give. I believe the Lord not only hears the words of our lips or the meditations of our heart, I believe he watches how we give, amen. Somebody say amen. We're living in an hour where uh, the first uh, symptom of the disease of this hour is men love pleasure? I want you to just, if you, if you want to think about where your priorities are, check your checkbook for about the last 90 days and circle everything that you paid for to give you pleasure. Stack that up against what you're going to give today and see where your heart is. Oh, Brother Gene, now don't make it that plain. Well, I think we ought to think in those terms. <laughs> This is where my heart is. Amen. I believe this is where my treasure will be. Somebody say amen. Thank you, Lord, for the sermon during the offering today. Lord, I pray you bless the people of God that came today. I pray you bless the offering that they give. Help us to give cheerfully with a whole heart. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Let's worship the Lord today with the praise team as they sing today.
to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above
them all. Every throne, every power. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Stand above them all. just feel after the Lord. Just take a few minutes. This is a worship service. This is not an entertainment service. This is not a concert. This is audience participation. This is our opportunity to praise the Lord together. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we lift our voices with the people of God. We lift our voices with the church of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for redemption. Give you praise, O oh Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we give you praise, Jesus. We give you the glory, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Oh, 
blessed be your name. Revive us. Breathe upon us today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, breathe upon your people today. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. I feel like the Lord gave me a word for this congregate, this local congregation today. Amen. And uh, I believe the Lord wants to speak to us. Somebody say amen. It is my responsibility now, regardless of what responsibility others may uh, place upon me, I have to recognize first and foremost that my responsibility is to feed the flock and to recognize the magnitude of that even in relation to the New Testament church when the apostles said we are getting so encumbered with other things that we uh, do not have time to pray and spend time in the word so that we can feed the flock so this is my obligation today in fact Ephesians chapter 4 we're emphatically told that we are given five-fold ministry for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry I'm responsible to feed this flock this flock is responsible to minister to one another and this community I'm not the only minister in the building I happen to be the pastor my responsibility is to feed the flock and so it was in this attitude that early this week and in my calendar my my set my priorities and on Monday my calendar will ding and say you better get ready Sunday's coming and so I begin to say Lord what would you have me say to your people And I felt emphatically, now I've heard the voice of the Lord enough. Let me say, I've ignored the voice of the Lord enough (laughs) to know how damaging that can be. But I've heard the voice of the Lord enough to know instantly when he speaks to me. And I know it was from the Lord. And he simply said two words, get ready. Get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor's going to talk to us about getting ready. Getting ready. Preparing. Preparing. Being prepared. Somebody say amen. Uh, We're in an interesting time, church. Amen. We are in an interesting time. We find where there are interesting times, and bear with me just for a moment. I know you've been standing for a while, but I'll be standing for a while longer, so I think you can. So help me here. There are interesting transitions in time in Scripture that when one door was closing and another was opening, most times it didn't happen instantaneously. It happened uh, maybe even over a, a, a period of time. We find when the door to the law was closing, the door to the ceremonial law was closing, and the door was swinging open to grace, I praise God, that there was, there was a lot of turmoil, there was a lot of, uh, there was things going on in, in the world, there was things going on in the people of God who had had this covenant for so long. Uh, But make no mistake about it, it was a tumultuous time because one door was shutting and another door was opening. I believe we are seeing the door of grace swinging shut. I believe the next door, which would be the millennial kingdom, the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, the rule of peace, I believe that door is starting to swing open. I believe this is going to be a a time of great tempest, a time of great uh, retrenching of what we believe and what we hope in and what we trust in. Somebody say amen. And so today I feel like the Lord has spoken to my heart. And so I want to lead you to 1 Kings chapter, 16, uh, chapter 15, 14 and verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 14. In verse 16, I want to preach today the hour of striving. 
The hour of striving. Say that with me. The hour of striving. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 16. It's one simple verse, and it states this. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. He shall give Israel up because of one person named Jeroboam and his sins. He sinned, but he made Israel to sin. The hour of striving. I want us to pray together right now. Lord, thank you for this time we have in your word. Lord, I praise you for what you're going to do in this place today. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We bless your name today. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. There's a magnitude in this very short verse that I read to you in your hearing. And the magnitude, the, the, uh, the seriousness of this verse is that in the first portion of 1 Kings 14, 16, it says, He shall give Israel up. That's pretty startling words when God says, I'm giving somebody up. I don't know about any of, all, any of you that are gathered here today, but I sure wouldn't want the Lord to give any of us up or me up or my family up. Wouldn't want him to give this church up. I wouldn't want him to give up on us. That's got to be a bad day when God gives up on somebody. And he says, I'm giving up on Israel. And I'm giving Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam. Who did sin and made Israel sin. Now, this is because of the sins of one man by the name of Jeroboam. And then we read that one verse, that, or, or the last portion of this verse, who made Israel to sin. It's kind of humorous sometimes, the, the blame the devil gets for our willful decisions. <laughs> the devil made me do that. The enemy made me do that. So-and-so made me do that, and if they wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have done this. Makai made me do that. No, Makai didn't make me do anything. He could probably whip me, but I don't think he can make me do anything. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> My old pastor's wife used to say, I, I'm uh, in her long study of human nature, she said, you know, I'm, I'm becoming convinced that most people do what they want to do what they really have a desire to do. So the magnitude of this verse is that God says, I'm giving Israel up because of the sins of one man, and he, by his sin, he made the entire nation of Israel sin. Now, that's pretty profound. And because of one man, God would give up Israel because one man caused Israel to sin. Now, let me give you a little history on Jeroboam. The first mention of the man Jeroboam in the very first verse that mentions his birth and this man's identity. It says in the very first mention of his name that he lifted his hand against the king. Now, that's pretty telling that on your birthday when they said this is his mother and this was his dad and this is what they named him, and the very next statement is... He lifted his hand against the king. This is the beginning of a man who ultimately would turn God to give up the children of Israel. And in the opening phrase of his life, his heart is already bent against the king. He lifted up not only his heart, but his hand would be lifted against the king. 
The Bible also gives us the identity of this man. He was a mighty man of valor, bravery. Amen. The Bible also tells us that he spent time in Egypt away from the king because his hand was lifted against the king. This causes rough times between the king and Jeroboam. So Jeroboam turned to the world. He spent time in Egypt. In fact, he spent so much, he stayed there until the king was dead. Then he came back to Israel ready to take over because the ruling king was dead. Now, if you're wondering when I'm going to start preaching, <laughs> when you're wondering when I'm going to translate, let me help with that just for a moment. There is no way you can have a takeover spirit until the king is dead. There's no way if any of us can get to the point where we are God's answer to this community or this church or this kingdom or this city without the king suffering in our lives and us putting his voice to silence. I want to hear the voice of the king. I want to be submitted to the voice of the king. I want to answer the call of the king. I want this church to have the blessing of the king. Uh, oh, anybody hearing me? And Jeroboam set his hand against the king. It was a terrible start. It didn't get any better. When the king died, he made his way back. And yes, because he's a man of bravery, a man of valor, a man who looked good to everybody else. He was made king over ten tribes of a divided kingdom, and that kingdom's name is Israel. It was ten tribes that uh, separated from the other tribes uh, that followed the house of David, the Bible tells us, and they were called Judah. And so now we have a divided kingdom, Israel and Judah. And so we have a king over Israel and a king over Judah. But the, the Bible uh, emphatically states that there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Now listen to that. This is very important. Here's an interesting fact also is, is the Bible states that of all the descendants of Jeroboam, only Jeroboam would be buried in a grave. Every descendant of Jeroboam that would come after him, the Bible states if they died in the city, the dogs would eat them. If they died in the field or in the country, the fowls would eat them. Not one descendant from Jeroboam forward would ever be buried in a grave. Why? The Bible states Jeroboam was the only one buried in a grave, and it states this, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel. Now, I've already stated that this is the man that caused God to give up on Israel. This is the man that because of his sin, God rejected the house of Israel. But God says, I'm going to bury him with honor in a grave because there is some good thing toward me. I'm going to preach today that if you're in this room today and maybe your hand has been lifted against the king, I believe there's some good in every person in this room here today. And I believe that if we'll follow after that which is good, I believe we can find salvation through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody give the Lord a good hand clap today. I'm preaching to you today about the hour of striving. For the Bible tells us that uh, there's something very important mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 12 about Jeroboam. It gives us, and bear with me as I give a little context to where I'm going today, the language of Jeroboam's heart. What made Jeroboam tick? What was it that caused him to do whatever it was he did, this sin of Jeroboam? The Bible tells us that Jeroboam had a motivating factor in his heart. It's that the children of Israel would return to the house of David. 
Jeroboam's fear was that he'd lose his power, that he would lose his influence, and that the tribes of Israel would go back to Jerusalem and fall back under the worship and, the, and, and, and fall back into the house of, of David as the Bible mentions it. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, Whereupon the king, this is Jeroboam, he took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, the children of Israel, notice what he said, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing, listen, and this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. Now what this verse is saying, that if God would give up Israel, and it's because of the sin of Jeroboam and him causing Israel to sin, we find the evidence of what it was in 1 Kings chapter 12. It's simply this. It was, it, it was such a long, costly trip to Jerusalem. It was such a difficult matter to gather your family, your, your traveling companions, and make that trek to Jerusalem. It was such a difficult task. I'm going to make it easy for you to worship God. I'll build two idols of gold, and I'll put one close to everybody that lives in the south, and I'll put one close to everybody that lives in the north. So you don't have to go very far to worship God. It seems quite harmless, even innocent. It, it sounds like that might be a good idea. It's too much for you, he said. To go up to Jerusalem. Yet in this short verse of scripture, we find the destroyer. Listen now. In this short verse of scripture, we find a destroyer of an entire nation. It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Jeroboam fears that if the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah continue to worship together, they will begin, become, become united together. Now, I don't have time to stop and preach that, but I want to tell you now, it is important to be in one mind, in one accord with this body. I want to tell you now, you need to make sure you know who your spiritual pastor is. You need to make sure you understand you are part of a body somewhere. And if it's not here, it needs to be somewhere. <laughs> I thank God I'm in the church. I thank God I've got people of God around me to support me and help me. I thank God he put me in this body. <laughs> Beware of the individual that will say, I need to keep some things divided. Jeroboam fears that if Israel keeps going to Jerusalem, they will eventually go back politically with Judah. So Jeroboam fears he's going to lose his power. He embarks on this separation operation. He wants to divide people. Notice he didn't make war with their worship. He didn't make war with their doctrine. He didn't make war with what they were teaching. He did not tell them their religion and their worship was futile or foolish. No. He didn't even try to convince people their worship was wrong. He would have had a fight on his hands had he done that. All Jeroboam said was, while your worship is a good thing, while your worship is perfectly right and proper, it's given you way too much trouble. Church ought to be convenient. If the pastor asks you to do something, it ought to be something you want to do. Committing ought to be an easy thing. Attending church ought to be less difficult. Going to Jerusalem is the right thing. There's no harm in going to Jerusalem, but it's too expensive. It takes way too much time. It takes way too much labor. It takes way too much money. And I want to tell you, religion has has. Uh, 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 digressed into that kind of attitude that we can't ask very much of anybody. We can't say much about anything. 
Come on, I know, I know we live in the great United States of America, but it, it's creeping in. It, it's jumping the fence just like other things are. It's not too far from here in a nation, not too far from here, that if they talk about certain things the Bible calls sin, the authorities show up and take the pastor and put him in jail. That's the world in which we live. I'm rising to this pulpit to tell you, church, we're in an hour where striving is going to win the day. We're in an hour where we've got to fight the good fight of faith, not a fight against flesh and blood, not a political fight. No, we've got to fight for what we believe. We've got to fight for our Savior. We've got to fight for our trust in Him. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord right now. Amen. Worshiping in Jerusalem, Jerobo Jerobo and probably said, hey, I'm all for that. And that's all fine and good for your fathers and your grandfathers. And that's the way they worship. They always made the trek to Jerusalem. But do you know how far that is? It's perfectly right to do what your fathers did. But, but I'm not sure that's all that necessary anymore. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at the eyes of students who say to me, Pastor, I know where we've been going all these years, but I'm not sure that's all necessary anymore. I know what the Word says, but I'm not sure that's a heaven or hell issue. The sin of Jeroboam was not that he stood against the worship of God's people. It's that he wanted it to be convenient for them. I don't know. But I just believe something's about to happen in our world. I believe we're living in the last days. And I don't believe it's going to get any easier to serve God. I don't believe it's going to get any easier to go to church. If you cannot walk with the footman, I want to tell you now, you cannot keep up with the galloping horses. And the horses are running. And it's time for the church to rise up and run the race with patience. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord today. Jesus, help me. So Jeroboam's offer was easy. It just said, I'll make religion easy for you. Set up a place, you know. <laughs> I will to tell you now, pastoring would be easy if we just do everything everybody thinks we ought to do. Pastoring would be easy if all I had to do was go around to about 10 or 15 of you every week and say, what do you think we ought to do? And you say, well, here's what I think we ought to do. And I go, okay, thanks, I'll go do that. And then about a month later, I come back and, and survey about another 15 of you and find out what you want me to do or what you think the kingdom of God ought to do. But you know what? What's amazing is submission is not tested when the church is doing what you want them to do. Submission is never tested. Submission never exists in an environment where everything's going your way. Submission is only revealed when it doesn't go your way. Well, I don't think we ought to do that. Well, Jeroboam, I, I think it ought to be easy for me to come to church. I think pastor ought to do what I want him to do. I think brother David ought to do what I want him to do. Well, that's fine and dandy if you want faith to be easy. But the sin of Jeroboam was he made it easy for everybody. And I'm not here to make it easy for everybody. I'm here to tell you we're in the final turn of the race. No, no, you're not hearing me. I've come to tell a backslider we are in the final turn of the race. Oh, I feel it. Oh, come on, let's worship the Lord for a minute. I feel a desperation in my spirit today. I've come to try to awaken somebody. I didn't come to tell you it's going to be easy. I didn't come to tell you you can identify with this world and still go to a holy heaven. I've come to tell you there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof is destruction. It's time to obey the Lord. He set up a place of worship for everybody to be close and convenient. Jeroboam said, I'm going to offer you a religion that is almost absolutely free of expense of any kind. I'm going to say that again. The sin of Jeroboam that caused Israel to say, I'm giving up Israel. 
is that Jeroboam said, I'm going to offer you the chance to worship, but it's not going to be very expensive. Worship's going to be free. Worship's not going to cost you anything. This is where I start sensing that people start getting a problem with works and everything's grace. And we come to church and grace makes everything free, (laughs) that nothing is costly, that God doesn't ask me to walk a certain way or think, thank God for that lesson today, Brother Justin, you did an awesome job. (laughs) I got a revelation in the middle of that, right at the end of that lesson today. I found out who the apple tree was. I found out what the chain was. And if you missed it, you'll have to go back and listen to it. And I found out who the professor was. I suddenly had a revelation of my mother. (laughs) I wondered why I got all them beatings I got. I've told you, my mom would be in jail today if I just went to the authorities. And all you newfangled stuff saying this is the way you ought to raise your kids, I want to tell you now, I'm standing here today because I was worthless and fruitless, but my mother realized I need to get him on the right path. And I'm telling you, when the professor's beating the side of the apple tree saying, I'm only doing this because I love you, it's hard to understand. But thank God for the fruit that comes because somebody cared enough to make you pay the price. And I want to tell you now, church, I haven't come to preach to you an easy religion. It's not going to be easy to get in the gate. Jesus said, you're going to have to strive. I know religion in our day wants to take take away the striving. They say, well, that's just works. You don't need to, well, pardon me. I'm going to preach Jesus today. (laughs) The plan of Jeroboam was very much the plan of Jeroboam. The Bible says that he caused Israel to sin because he offered them a religion that was absolutely free of expense. And what's amazing is, if you'll read in your Bible, I noticed that I, I... You know, for how many, 40 years, this has been my work. And as I'm praying and studying, I keep remembering uh, passages in Scripture that talks about the ways of Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam. So I just go on my trusty little computer uh, Bible, and I just typed in the way of Jeroboam or the sins of Jeroboam. And long after this man is dead, the Bible keeps saying that there are people that walked, every generation that walked in the way of Jeroboam. I want to tell you, it's popular language when somebody gets up and says, no, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to pay any price. You don't have to worship like that. Why are you so fanatical? And there are a lot of people that like to walk in that way, but that's a sinful way. I want to tell you, he that wants to follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I want to tell you, heaven is not not going to be a place where there are no willful people. No, you're not. Heaven is not going to be a place where everybody there has no will. No, heaven is going to be a place where everybody there has a submitted will to Jesus Christ. When Jesus is in that garden, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Heaven is not a place for willless, heartless people. No, heaven is a place where people have taken up a cross and say, Lord, whatever I need to do, I want to do it. I want to be saved. Oh, come on, let's lift our hands and worship the Lord for a moment. Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord, not to listen to the spirit of this age. In fact, I want to declare to you today as I go forward in this message, I'm hurrying to a close. I made up my mind I'm too old to preach over an hour. Say, well, thank God he's getting old. This plan of Jeroboam is very much alive and well in churches and in people to this very day still present with us. The sin of Jeroboam is still present in 2024. And it sounds something like this. Listen, do not make truth the test of your worship. 
Do not make its power to save and transform the test of your worship. Let ease be the test of your worship. Choose the church. Choose the worship that makes the smallest demands. Well, I don't want to go to that church because I got to do this or I got. No, you don't have to do anything. I want to tell you now, if you think you're going to go to heaven doing your thing, you've got another thing coming, as my parents used to say. (laughs) Here's a fact. We can never become our best without facing and overcoming difficulties. In fact, that's true physically. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Oh, sorry, listening to the Olympics? See how funny that is? I'm the only guy in this building that doesn't have a TV. Isn't that funny? But I got it on my phone. <laughs> let's, not, let's not stop there because I ain't preaching about TV today. If you've been watching the Olympics, you know, Simone Biles probably all last year, she probably, you know, didn't come out of her bedroom much. She probably laid on her bed watching videos of her younger days when she was really good and she probably ate donuts every morning and chips in the afternoon and cheeseburgers every night yeah i don't know what her body mass index is i'm not sure what her bmi is but i'll tell you this i ain't no cheeseburgers and chips and donuts and I want to tell you, she wasn't laying in bed the day before the Olympics and then just go decide to go flipping over 11 feet in the air. Paul said it this way, every person that strives for the mastery is tempered in all things. And we've got a generation that doesn't want to be tempered. They don't want to make a sacrifice. But if you're going to finish this race, you're going to have to strive because we're nearing the end. I'm preaching, we're nearing the end, church. If there's ever a time to press for the mark, it is right now. If there's ever a time to pray, it is right now. If there's ever a time to be in church, it is right now. If you're waiting for the right moment, that hour has come. We are in the hour where striving is going to win the day. We're in the hour where if you want it easy, you're going to fall out of the race. You've got to keep pressing. You've got to keep running. (laughs) Oh, lift your hands and love the Lord right now. I'm hurrying. Not only is it true that we become our best when we overcome difficulties, it's true spiritually, not only physically, intellectually. Think about it. Not only intellectually, and I'm not going to talk about going to school. We're about to go back to school, but, you know, if you do your homework, study your lessons, intellectually challenge yourself, it's going to benefit you. It's true spiritually. The door is locked to those. The door is locked to those who will never knock. (laughs) But to he that knocketh. (laughs) If you never seek, you will never find. Don't sit in this room and tell me if God wants me to have it, he'll just back the dump truck up and dump it on me. No, you've got to knock, you've got to seek, and you've got to ask. If you never ask, you never receive. If you never seek, you never find. And I've got something else for you. If you don't strive, you won't make it. I want... I want to tell these students that sit up here every Sunday faithfully, I want to tell them they're in an hour where if they don't strive, they're not going to make it. I want to tell moms and dads, (laughs) I started to say if you don't get up off something, but then I thought, no, that might not be too spiritual. I want to tell moms and dads, If you think church and religion and commitment to Jesus Christ and salvation ought to come easy, you're not going to make it. 
In fact, there's a question asked of the Lord that seemingly is completely out of context. In fact, the verse before states this. Listen, the verse before states this. And he went through the villages and cities teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Now that's about as plain as you can get. That's about as uneventful. Jesus went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. The very next verse, look at it, Luke 13, 23. Out of the blue. He's just going from city to city teaching. Somebody asked him. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Luke 13, 23. Lord, are there few that be saved? Now, if there's ever a moment, Brother Keith, the Lord could say, no, no, there's a lot of people saved. In fact, all Christian people are on the, they're not on the same road, but they're all going to the same destination. If there was ever a moment Jesus could have said, it doesn't matter what you believe, we're all going to be before the Lord, we're all going to heaven, it's all okay. If there was a moment for him to say, everybody's saved. This would be the moment. This man has this context from being a Jew. And he says, Lord, only we know salvation is of the Jews. Only the Jews are saved. And he said, Lord, are only a few people saved? I want you to notice Jesus' response in verse 24. To the question, Lord, are there few that be saved? Jesus says... Strive to enter the straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Did, is that verse up there? Okay, leave it up there. I want you to see two words. They're going to be easy for you because they're S words. Strive to enter into the straight gate, at the straight gate. Notice strive. Everybody say strive. He says that. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. I say unto you, for I say unto you, uh, for many, I say unto you, will seek. Everybody say seek. Notice we've got a difference between strive and seek. He says seek. I don't believe God wants us to be a seeker sensitive church. Because this verse says seekers will not enter. No, uh, he said we're get, <laughs> We're in an hour now where seekers may even miss it. <laughs> we're in an hour where it's going to take more than seeking. <laughs> it's going to take striving to enter. No, I I know, I know who God's called me to feed today. I know there are men and women sitting women sitting under the sound of my voice that have sought things, and because you didn't get certain answers, you're tired of seeking and you're outside the door. That's because we're in an hour where seekers may miss it. We are in an hour where you're gonna have to strive to enter in at the straight gate. Many will seek. It's five minutes to 12. If I let you out right now and you took a drive down Main Street, you'll see church parking lots full of seekers. How many strivers are there? How many people saying, whatever price I need to pay, Lord, I'm going to make it. I'm going to run the race with patience. Lord, I'm not in this to lose. I'm not looking for convenience. I'm not looking for an easy gospel. This word is used, the word strive. The Lord said, Jesus said, turn to your neighbor and tell him, Jesus said strive. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not important that you strive. Jesus said to the question, are there few that will be saved? Jesus said, strive that you may enter in at the straight gate. 
The word strive is a, is a word used to describe the struggle of an athlete. The word is at home on the field of competition. It has the connotation of a battlefield. It means somebody is fighting. It means somebody is pressing. It's got the connotation of a soldier on a battlefield. That's what the word, the the Greek word strive means. It's got the connotation of a soldier fighting for his life. Oh, I would to God I could stir that up in you today. It says, Lord, I'm in a fight for my spiritual life, and I'm going to strive. I'm going to get up again. I'm going to run. I, come on, you may be a falling out of the race, but today the Lord is calling you back into the race. It's not too late. We heard it already. He loves you. It's a word. It has a connotation of being out of breath, muscle straining, hands stained with blood. This, I'm preaching, this is the hour for strivers. The rich young ruler, you remember, he turned away. He turned away because the road was too much of a struggle. That's too hard. That's too narrow. Must I remind you of Demas? The Bible tells us, Paul said, he's forsaken me, having loved this present age. The present age makes... uh, I'll tell you now, this present world makes less demands on you. The present age will tell you, wake up tomorrow, you can be a boy. Wake up the next day, you can be a girl. There are no demands on this society in which we live. Do whatever you want to do, and it should be okay and tolerated. I want to tell you, the church doesn't march to the drumbeat of this age. The age... uh This present age will put no demands on you. But this is the church of the living God. This is the people that have been bought by the blood of Jesus. You are not your own. Somebody purchased you with their own blood. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I want to tell you, I wouldn't ever want the Lord to say, I'm giving up that church, or I'm giving up that family, or I'm giving up that pulpit. I want to tell you, I've seen churches decide to make it easier for their worshipers, and I've watched the Spirit of God walk out. I'm in the privacy of the body that I'm called to preach to and feed. But the fact of the matter is this service is going to be watched by all kind of people that I am not called to feed. So they may not understand the spirit or the attitude or the pastoral heart that I'm about to say this in. But that's okay. I'm going to say it to this body because this is who I'm called to. I've rubbed shoulders with them. They held offices in the United Pentecostal Church International. They preached youth congresses. They preached conferences. And I watched them try to make ease, make it easy for their worshipers. And I watched as their Facebook pages and their Instagram posts began to change. And I've heard now that you'll see them sitting in the bar with their kids. And they're all drinking a nice drink. And oh, see, there's nothing wrong with all that. I've not come to tell you serving God's going to be easy. There There may be a price to pay, but I'm telling you, it will be worth it all when you see Jesus. Don't come up here and tell me what brother so-and-so's doing that or sister so-and-so's doing that. I don't care what they're doing. I'm striving for the race. I'm striving for the finish line. Get your eyes on the finish line. We're about to hear him say, well done. Oh, come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. Demas hath forsaken me because the present age made no demands. It'll always be easier to follow the world because the world demands nothing of you. 
and you think that's really cool. Man, if the church was like that, it'd be easy. And the sin of Jeroboam, he caused Israel to sin by taking the easy path. Matthew 7, 13. I'll wait till they get it up there. Matthew 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The surface definition of the word straight simply means narrow. And that's what Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. But a deeper dive into the Greek word of straight is the gate. That means not only is it a narrow space, but it is constricting. It is hard. It is severe. It is confining. In fact, one translation of the Greek word straight is the gate means it's like being cornered. cornered for Jesus not my way Lord but your way not what I want Lord but what you want (laughs) it's a way of limitations it's a way that says I'm rejecting that I'm not listening to that I'm not watching that I'm not reading that I'm not saying that I'm not wearing that wide is the path where you can wonder at your own will and do your own thing but Jesus says narrow Lord help me stay in that narrow way I'm not saying we ought to tell people they got to do things just because we want to control them and see what they wanted to know but I must realize I thought about a number of titles for this sermon today especially when I wrote this statement that as a church we must resist the lure of the broad way I've been wondering, Sister Tracy, all these years why I bought a house on Broadway. God put this preacher right on the Broadway. And then I thought, we just came back from Baltimore. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law, David, celebrated his 60th uh, birthday. And we we got our GPS, and it was taking us to their house. And it says, "Your, your turn's upcoming. And and in one mile, you'll turn left on Easy Street. I live on Broadway. My brother-in-law lives on Easy Street. God knows where to put the preacher, right? We got to resist the Broadway. Every person who accomplishes anything worthwhile does so at the price of hard work it's a good day for us when we cease to expect something for nothing we live in a society that wants that it may take some of us a little while to find this out but you can't ever get something for nothing your accomplishment as as a child of God is subject to great demands Jesus may wake you up one night and say now take your boy to a mountain that I will show you and you can't explain it and you, other people say well I've never found that in the Bible anywhere but all you know is this voice spoke to you to sacrifice something and you say you know what he's my God and I love him and I'm going to sacrifice this every one of us have had an Isaac we had to put on the altar Every one of us in the world doesn't understand it. Well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? Well, I may not be able to find black and white for it, but I know the voice of God. And the voice of God wants me to trim in my boundaries. And the voice of God wants me to border in my journey. And he wants me to walk in the straight gate.
Now, I guess I shouldn't be embarrassed anymore to preach a straight gospel. Christianity has become so anti-works, they've ceased to strive for anything. I won't tell you his name. I won't even tell you where he's at, whether he's a friend or, or an enemy. But I'll tell you this. There's a board member at one of the large, well, it used to be one of the largest members of this community that says, you know what? Our church is not broken anymore. That's why God is not in there. That's why we're not experiencing anything is because there's no brokenness. And in a board meeting, and the pastor told the entire board, in five years, this church will not exist. That's in this town. Religion is easy. Walking up to the front and shaking the preacher's hand and signing a membership card is easy. But if you're going to get in the gate, you're going to have to strive. Pastor, what do I need to do? Pastor, tell me what I need to do. Pastor, preach the word of God to me. Pastor, don't hold back. Tell me the whole counsel of the Lord. Why did the children of Israel, which came out of Egypt with such great promises, why did they die in the wilderness? Yeah. Why did they die in the wilderness? Those people are giants, and we are grasshoppers. They would not even go into battle, even when the Lord said, I've given you their cities. They wanted the ease of the wilderness. We liked it when we had garlic and cucumbers for supper every night. And they died there. And they lost their promise there. What promise have you lost because you wanted it easy? They would not, the Bible tells us, they would not strive to enter in. Now I'm closing. I'm closing now. So in the context of this verse I read in Luke where the man asked or person asked, Lord, will there be few saved or is every church saved and every de denomination saved and every believer saved? Is everybody saved? And Jesus said, oh, he begins to explain. He says, oh, oh no, but if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to strive. Verse 25. Luke 13, verse 25. Look what Jesus said. When once the master of the house is risen up. Everybody say he's risen. Look at this. There's a door closing. You see this? The master is rising and there's a door closing. And he says, when the door closes, you begin to stand without. And now you begin to knock. And now you begin to say, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not when she are. Notice, he says that if you're going to enter the kingdom, you've got to strive. The problem is, is that the master of the house is going to rise. And there's going to be a door that's going to be shut. And when the door is shut, people are going to get really urgent at that moment. And now they will beat on the door. Oh, I'm preaching to you that the master of the house has risen. And the door to the law has closed. But I want to tell you, the master is about to come back. And the door to grace is swinging shut. Don't wait till the door closes until you begin to ask, until you begin to seek, until you begin to knock. Let me, let me say this to you. We, we don't take account at prayer meeting. We don't take account at prayer meeting. That's, that's whosoever will, let him come. Recognize that? There's some Mondays you can't be there. Some Mondays I can't be there. We don't take any. We don't, it's not mandatory attendance. But I want to tell you when prayer meeting is going to be full. And I want you to remember the words of this man standing before you. I want to tell you, the Monday, or it's not even going to be Monday. I want to tell you when prayer meeting is going to be full. I want to tell you when it's going to be easy to get people to the altar. 
Sherry won't be on the keyboard and I won't be up here saying, well, please come on up here and just spend five minutes. They're going to be in this building. They may not even have a key. They'll bust the glass to that door and they'll be up here in the front and they'll be over there in that old sanctuary and they'll be praying and beating on the door. But the door is shut. Why is it that our urgency comes to life after the door is shut? Do you realize how privileged you are to be here today? To feel what I feel. To even hear the word of God preached. And I'm going to, man, he's getting long. My roast is burning. I need to get out. Are you, are you serious? If you're going to make it. You're in the hour of striving. This is an hour. This is an hour when those that want it easy are falling by the wayside. This is a, this is an hour when we start getting out of breath and we say, you know what? I'm pressing on, Sister Sandy. I may be wounded, but I'm pressing on. I may be hurt, but I'm pressing on. I may have been knocked down, but I'm pressing on. I may have gotten out of the fight, but I'm pressing on. Notice they begin to knock. They begin to strive at the door. The moment it's shut, they'll do more than they've ever done to get in. I'm giving you the opportunity today because the door is still open. Look at verse 26. Then shall ye begin to say, look, look, you'll knock on the the door shut, but you're going to knock on the door and you're going to tell me how you used to go to church and how you were raised in this and how your grandma was filled with the Holy Ghost. You're going to tell me how you ate and drank in the presence of the Lord, but you weren't desperate. You wouldn't press. But Lord, we've been in your presence. We've received the bread of life, your word. We've been in your spirit. But the door shut. Verse 27. But he shall say, look at this. The master who closed the door will say, I tell you, I know you not when she are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when they shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And they themselves are you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come. I love this. They shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. And they shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Did you hear that? Jesus said that there are people that missed it because they wanted it easy. And he says there's going to be people from all over the world that paid the price, that sit down in the kingdom. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets. Why did you miss it? Because you didn't strive in the hour of striving. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, help us. In the name of the Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. Come here, Rekai. Jose, come here. Xavier, come here. Come here. Come here. Just line up facing that way. Line up facing that way. All right, hey, he said, the gate's going to be straight, and the only way you're going to get in that narrow gate is if you strive to get in. And he said, there are going to be people that will not strive until the gate closes. You just heard it. I just read it to you. He just, he just went through all of that. A answer to the question, are there going to be few people saved? He says, he doesn't even answer yes or no. He just says, I want to tell you, if you're saved, it's going to be with difficulty. It's not going to be easy to be saved. Can I get an amen, Brother Lester? It's not easy being saved, is it? You got to fight. You got to fight depression and discouragement and worry and misunderstandings and why God didn't heal your spouse. You're going to have to press.
Yeah. Yeah. He, he states all this. And then he gets down to the last verse 30. And behold, and this is the one we, we quote it all the time. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Remember that phrase? He says it many times. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Remember that? It's in the context of salvation. It's in the context of pressing. It's in the context of the race. Okay. This, this is not last or first because the guy last just goes, Oh, well, it's, I don't have to do anything, but one of these days I'm going to be first. No. And it's not the first guy saying, You know what, I like being first, but, you know, just one day I'm going to be last. No, this is in the context of a race. The first will be last, and the last shall be first. Now just imagine, Brother Burner, us four fellows are all in the race, and I'm last. Everything in me wants to be first, but I'm last. How do I get from last to first? It's not just God saying, okay. Switch places with me. God said the first. Or now you're last, and now he's first. See, oh, grace of God. No. Get back up here. He's first. I'm last. Noah, and the Bible says the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's in the context of the race, pressing for the prize. And the guy in the last... He may finish this race last, but I want to tell you what. Like Michael Jordan, the night he lost the national championship as a freshman at North Carolina, when everybody else got off the bus and went home for a holiday, Michael Jordan got his stuff. He went right into Chapel Hill University Gymnasium, and he started practicing in the middle of the night. The guy that's last says, I'm going to keep striving. I'm going to keep pressing. I'm going to keep running. <laughs> and I may be behind my fear right now, but I'm going to keep pressing. And I'm going to get in front of my fear. And I'm going to keep striving. And I'm going to keep running. And I may be behind my depression right now, but I'm going to keep running. And I'm going to keep fighting. Because the last shall be first. And the first shall be last. I'm going to get in front of my fear. I'm going to get in front of my worry. I'm pressing. I'm pressing. I'm going to keep on. I've come to tell somebody, don't quit. I've come to tell somebody, don't stop. Don't give up. Don't quit now. My God, don't stop now. You're too close to the end. Come on. Come on, let's stand together and give the Lord praise right now. This is the hour of striving. I want you to reach over and pray with somebody right now. Come on. Students, adults, parents, kids, all across this room. I want you to pray for your friend. I want you to pray right now, Lord, stir me. I want to be saved. striving listen to me now listen to me now I, don't live, I do not want to live my entire life with my finger in the air trying to figure out which way the wind's blowing I don't need to go on the internet and figure out what God's doing right now where are we at in prophecy And come urgent saying, oh, brother Gene, but I want to tell you something. We're in a crucial moment right now. 
I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be worried. I'm not agitated today because I know God has his eye on his people. And if he can feed two million people in the middle of a desert, he can take care of us when the whole thing turns upside down. But I want to tell you right now, on my way to church this morning, the forecasters are saying, as early as tonight, as early as tonight, Iran's going to mount a, a massive offensive against Israel. And the commentator stated, he said, Iran doesn't want to go into this alone. Iran wants the whole world against Israel. Now, I want to tell you now, if there's ever a time for you to knock on the door, it's right now. If there's ever a time for you to get in the church, it's right now. It's not too late. I'm not going to be upset with you because you did everything you did, and now you're coming in at the last minute. I'm going to celebrate with you, but now's the time to get in. Now's the time to be faithful. I'm going to celebrate with you. Now's the time to make your commitment. So I want to see somebody that's brave today. I want to see hearts that are ready to strive today. I'm calling for people that will say, Pastor, I've been taking it a little easy, but I'm going to strive even more than I've ever strove before. I'm going to make, I'm going to run with patience the race. I want to open the altar right now. Somebody say, Lord, give me strength to press on. Give me strength to press on. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, if you need the baptism of the Spirit, today's your day. If you're a backslider, come on right now. If you're uncommitted, come on now. Come on, I can't make it easy for you. It's going to be tough for you to walk out of that chair and make your hour of decision at this moment but it'll be worth it. Come on. Come on, I know some of you got children to care for and you got things to care for and you, maybe you're up here in your heart and you cannot come physically. Come on, let's turn this sanctuary into a place of prayer right now. Come on, all over this building. Lord, help me to strive. I'm in the hour when striving wins. I'm in the hour when striving wins. Oh, Jesus, come abide in this place. I'm running the race. I may be last, but I'm moving up. I'm turning the corner. I may be behind, but I'm moving up. Oh, I'm striving. Come on, saints of God. Come on, cold heart. Awaken, cold heart. Come on. Oh, in the name of Jesus. to you. Come on, make the commitment. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus.
to him. Come on, the Holy Ghost is moving. Come on, somebody's committing their life to Jesus. Somebody's saying, yes, Lord. to one another. Don't force anybody, but let's let the Lord have his way right now. You feel like God is calling you to reach a little further. Come on. Right now can be a moment somebody gets back in the race.
Come on, let the voices of God's people be raised right now in prayer unto the Lord. Come on, all over the house. Come on, sometimes we just sing our prayers, but right now we're going to say our prayers. Come on, we're going to speak to God right now. Lord, help us to endure to the end. Oh, thank you, Lord, that I shall be saved if I endure to the end. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we are more than a conqueror through him that loved us. Oh, I praise you for the promises you've given your people, God. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your hand that's on us, Lord. I give you praise, Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I give you the praise, Lord. Give you the praise, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Come on, in your own way, right now, give everything to Jesus. Just give it all to Jesus. Right now, Lord, I give you everything. Oh, Lord, we lay it all down. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Lord, for the straight gate. Thank you, Lord, for the narrow way. We're going to find it. We're going to walk in it. I praise you for it, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm pressing for the mark. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Seal it in our hearts right now, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of 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 the Lord Jesus. Oh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Have your mighty way, Lord. Have your mighty way, Jesus. Have your mighty way. Have your mighty way, Lord. Have your mighty way, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Yes, yes, I praise you for your word. Well, let's thank the Lord for his word today, through the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, I praise you. Come on, lift up your praise unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's not a mountain too tall
Nobody cares about us. So wait on the Lord. We're waiting on you, Lord. strength, Lord, and he'll renew your strength, oh, wait on the Lord, <laughs> wait on the Lord, hey, we need to wait on the Lord, oh, hey, we need Let's love Jesus right now. Hallelujah. Oh, lift your hands and love him right now. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. 
Somebody shout praise the Lord. Well, you know me, I'm resting enough now, I feel another preach on me. Just hang on just a second. I think it's in there. I've read it before. Somebody say amen. Somebody say, Lord, help him find what he's looking for. <laughs> amen. Isn't the Lord good? I know it's in there, but I'll just quote it. Ain't no sense in looking for it if you know it. The Bible talks about the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive, I'm going to be here. I said, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be alive, and I'm going to still be here. When he comes back, I'm going to be remaining. <laughs> I'm going to still be in the race. Somebody say amen. Amen. Isn't the Lord good today? Amen. Well, thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for hearing the word of the Lord today. Thank you for being faithful to church today. Isn't God good? Amen. We're going to let them sing whatever they want. We're going to let you go eat your lunch, whatever you want. Amen. Greet somebody and tell them I'm going to be in the race when it's all said and done. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Amen. I'm going to keep running the race. God bless you in Jesus' name.